Okay, so we're still recording, and uh, we're going to do a second show uh, that's just questions from the audience. Unfortunately, we don't have, like, a microphone to take around. So I'm going to repeat your question. So is there anything you wanted to say or... Yeah. Yeah, okay, so as Christians, as we live in an unchristian world that's increasingly less Christian, what do we do about it? Are you thinking about it specifically in relationship to this particular matter or just in general? To the article, just okay. in, in terms of where it dealt as a whole and how un, the, it seems like the opposite, the opposition, you know, not Christian, just the world in general right. doesn't so, support what we're saying. You know, and it's... I mean, whether you want to talk about it as a very article or whatever, it just seems to be pulling in the opposite direction. Yeah, so I, I'll just kind of interpret a little bit at what I think you're saying is that, you know, we got a lot of things that the world is pressing us on. The, the fairy tales is, is one of those things in terms of, you know, traditional understandings of fairy tales. How do we respond to that as Christians? As Christians. Any thoughts, guys? Well, maybe I can start, and, and then Glenn can pick up off of me if he's got anything, and, and you as well. Um, I, I mean, I think one of the things is we, we remember what our mission is, um, bringing all things into conformity to Christ. Um, and so that means all things. Notice what all of these people are doing, these different literary critics and thinkers. They're bringing all things into the lens of their perspective. They're trying to interpret all of reality in light of what they believe the truth is. We just need to start doing it. Rather than borrowing their lens, we need to actually draw upon the riches that we have, the lens, the light that illumines all things, and start reading the whole of reality, interpreting it, and presenting interpretations of it from that full vision. I mean, that's what the Enlightenment did. It, it ripped off things from Christianity, had a new light, right, grounded in the human being in some way, humanism or something, and it read all of reality and interpreted it from that point. And now we're seeing it, it kind of crumble because it wasn't built on this, this eternal you know, foundation, much less anything that, that, that sticks in the long haul apart from what it borrowed from Christianity. So I think that's the first thing is not to lose confidence, but actually gain it. As a matter of fact, we're living in such unhinged times that on the one hand, yeah, there is a certain nervous, nervousness that grows by the irrationality and the inability to communicate. Um, but on the flip side, we're dealing with a, some of the flimsiest accounts of reality and relation to it um, imaginable. Um, this has nothing like the pseudo solidity of like old, old secularism or old um, kind of imperial communism, which makes it very dangerous um, but also weak. So I think we're, we're at a point where we, we don't lose confidence in the riches we have, but we run with them. Yeah, the thing that I would add to that is that one of the problems that we have is, well, you know, fish don't know fish are wet. You know, we're, we're in a culture that that is running, I mean, there are some places where it's really obvious where it's running away from truth. But there are so many ways that, that the culture compromises or attacks truth or just ignores it that we don't even really pay attention to because we're just immersed in it. And one of the, one of the tricks we have, to, we have to learn is to keep coming back to the question of what is true. How do I view this subject in light of the Lordship of Christ? How do I view this issue? How do, you know, and, and it's hard because the fact of the matter is we, you know, well, friendship with the world is enmity with God, okay? Um, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, in a sense, every generation is facing the same kind of issue. I think ours are kind of, uh, we, we've got a pileup of them, but every generation faces this. So what we've got to be doing constantly is reading, I mean, one of the things I think that, that we do in the show or we try to do in the show is to expose 
different areas that people aren't talking about that um, that we really need to be thinking Christianly about. You know, it's one of the reasons why I brought up fairy tales today. Um, we, we, we need to keep coming back to that. We need to keep to learn to look at everything through the lens of the Lordship of Christ. That's really ultimately the answer. It's tough, though, because there are so many things we assume um, and don't even know that we're doing it. And, you know, and there's a kind of a, uh, an opportunity for us at this time to actually be the champions for something that I think some people would never sort of uh, think we would be the champions for, and that is reason. It's like we're the only people who believe in reason anymore. And like we have, now I'm not saying that reason saves anybody, but it's a gift uh, of God and it's something that reflects the mind of God and it's for those reasons that we have an ability to defend reason itself. Kind of a weird moment we find ourselves in. I, I grew up in a world where people thought that reason was something that you gave up when you became a Christian. When it, and now we find ourselves in a weird situation where or maybe this is maybe this has always been the case where we're the guys who defend reason. Everybody <laughs> else has given up on it. <laughs> anyway, other, yeah. other questions? Yeah. So, kind of a new phenomenon literature in the past couple hundred years would be science fiction, for instance. I'm just curious, how would you all compare and contrast that with the fairy tale um, genre? And in what ways is it or is it not, you know, profitable for the formation of our, you know, imagination? Okay, that's a great question. Let me repeat, repeat. Uh, and summarize it a little bit. So the question has been asked, how about science fiction? Is it something that we can think about in the same way that we think about uh, fairy tales? Uh, is it redeemable? Is it useful? Uh, or maybe, and I think this is implied, the, the questioner didn't say this, is it irredeemable? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, let me, let me start off with, I, I'm a fan of science fiction. I enjoyed science fiction as a kid. And I think one of the things that C.S. Lewis wanted to do was use the genre uh, to think about certain things that uh, perhaps would never have been ever associated with science fiction with his space trilogy. But there are other Christian writers of science fiction. I think Gene Wolfe is one, uh, and I think we could identify some others. But what do you guys think? You know, is, is science fiction someplace we want to go? Um, I would say yes. Um, I'm, I'm more of a fantasy guy than a sci-fi guy. But the problem with fantasy is that it's sort of, I would argue in many ways, most modern fantasy has almost lost its way. Uh, the, the beauty of fantasy and science fiction, particularly these days, is that it's the only area of literature where people are asking big questions. Yeah. You know, um, fantasy did that, but now it's become a lot, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of modern fantasy just really doesn't go there. Uh, but sci-fi, I think, still does. And, you know, so if you want to explore big philosophical questions, the best place to look on sort of a, a popular level, if you don't want to read formal philosophy, uh, is in science fiction. Now there are some there are exceptions in in, fan, in the fantasy world as well, but um, I think sci-fi is really good for that. Yeah, I would I would I would add you know I, I agree with that, and I would also add that the, besides talking about raising big philosophical questions, there often tends to be the big. Um, philosophical question of immortality, which becomes a, a big issue with a lot of science fiction. But also, there is a sense of imagination that a lot of science fiction writers have that are able to foresee, in many ways, um, a lot of the results of what happens when, when they imagine worlds in light of what, what their imagination is creating. And so sometimes there's a sinister connection between what we're experiencing now and some writer was writing about when they thought about these things a long time ago. Not as though they're, they're prophets in, in, in the biblical sense, but they, they have, uh, through their imagination and th this form, uh, 
um, an ability to really see consequences and and connections. Um, th- uh, there's a Christian philosopher, Stephen R. L. Clark. He's a very interesting guy. I would call him more of a Christian neo-Platonist than a kind of. He, he's got some of his stuff can give, get a little funny. But he wrote a brilliant book called How to Live Forever, Science Fiction and Philosophy. And the real the, the thrust of the book is really about the way in which the question of immortality and big questions um, is, is, is something that that form of writing tends to be able to deliver on over and over again. So I would say yes. And, and I think uh, Lewis, you know, tried his hand at some, some stuff, you know, in connection with it, too. Yeah, I think that a couple of things come to mind for me uh, related to science fiction. One is that, you know, there are essentially two approaches that science fiction writers take. One is a kind of dystopian future, and one is a kind of uh, future is great. <laughs> you know, like Star Trek, at least classic Trek, was, you know, the future is great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, there's that. that. But a lot of science fiction is kind of more in the spirit of Mary Shelley and Frankenstein. You know, what are we going to make of the future using these techniques that we have for manipulating and controlling the physical world? And the idea is that in some sense, our fallenness is instantiated or put on display uh, through our mastery of the physical world. And that's why all of these dystopias uh, occur. You know, one of the things that we kind of go through these cycles with kind of the end of the world science fiction stories about the end of the world. So like when I was a, when I was a kid, you know, in the early 70s, you know, we had the Club of Rome and all of the predictions about <laughs> ecological catastrophes that would happen and all that kind of stuff. So by, by the way, I've been through this whole ec- ecology, the end of the world ecology thing like three or four times now. And uh, I'm still waiting <laughs> yeah. for the world to end. But if you go back to like the early 70s, you know, it seemed like, you know, Charlton Heston specialized in end of the world movies for like a period of time. <laughs> so, you know, you had Omega Man and, you know, Planet of the Apes, you know, and then my favorite, Soylent Green. Now, you know, speaking to that, remember when that, that drink came out, Soylent? I was like, haven't these people seen any of the, you haven't seen, haven't seen Soylent Green? I mean, they actually think that's a good name for a product. You know, you know it's crazy. But anyway, uh, but those two kind of d- things going on. Now, there, there are some uh, works uh, in science fiction that really take us way into the future. Obviously, Dune is one of those. Uh, yeah. But another is Hyperion, Dan Simmons. Now, Hyperion, I don't know if uh, folks are familiar with it, but uh, it ex- it's a, actually a pretty significant exploration of theological themes. So one of the things you can do with science fiction, particularly when you put it into the distant future, is sort of play out certain sort of trends and sort of unexpected outcomes uh, because of those trends. And Hyperion is one of those. But there are are other uh, Christian writers who have actually done a lot of interesting things in science fiction. I'm thinking of Cordwainer Smith. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he was kind of big in the 50s and the 60s but he was very self-consciously Christian in some of the work he did. And a lot of people in the world of science fiction look to him for inspiration. But anyway, um, that, that, uh, hopefully that, that at least does a little justice to the, que- to the question. Yeah, yeah. So you talked a, a while ago about the Disney approach to fairy tales and kind of a whitewashing of them. It seems like in the last say 10, 20 years, we've kind of gone to the opposite extreme where everything is being pushed towards a more gritty version of, of what it was before. So I think it's most evident with like Battlestar Galactica and Star Trek, um, but it's also present in a number of other stories and even both published in. Yeah, so, the, so the, the question, or maybe the statement is, is that we seem to be kind of moving away from this bodlerization to a more sort of uh, gritty kind of thing for its own sake. Maybe that's a way to kind of think about it, the grittiness for its own sake, whereas maybe, you know, the kind of uh, scary stuff that we see with the Brothers Grimm actually reflected a reality. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Um, One of the things I'd wanted to point out is that um, one of the trends that Disney has now is doing uh, films for the villains. You know, so you've got Maleficent and things like that, where they try to 
humanize and, and make sympathetic the villains of the classic fairy tales. Um, <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, Gregory Maguire, uh, he wrote uh, Wicked, that became a Broadway play <laughs> where the Wicked Witch of the West has made us, you know, it's, she's actually a sympathetic character. And uh, was it Glinda, the, uh, the, the, the witch from the, it was the nice mm -hmm. witch? Who was actually yeah, kind the of, good witch. Yeah, she was kind of like a uh, egotist and full of herself uh, and uh, kind of nasty <laughs> in the story. Yeah, what what you have going on there is sort of you know this again this softening. Um, you know, if we only understood all the problems that went into the the you know the the evil person's background, we'd actually be able to sympathize with them. That move, but then once once social justice takes over, what you'll see is that evil one is actually good, and everyone else that has oppressed this one, so they're 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 mainly enacting their place as being oppressed and therefore you know everyone else should be seen as the evil one and the evil one should be seen as kind of this pristine good right i mean there is this kind of thing but you also see this kind of um because again we tend to see um polarities develop in within society and in culture that go to extremes after a long hyper rationalism, um, you have this sometimes this turn turn to remember that we're embodied creatures. This deep kind of naturalism, and so they'll begin to do films that look at these uh, more gross aspects of, of the human or life. You know, it'll there'll be a screenshot in a film looking at maggots, you know, eating something raw, right? Touching on that that aspect. So so you see. Um, you don't. You, it just will focus strictly on that and nothing else, right? So, um, so you do see the, these kind of uh, tendencies of emphasis um, that 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 become central with, when when the whole vision gets kind of taken out of sync. Yeah, you know, uh, it's not as though we're just like advocates for grittiness or like scariness. You know, <laughs> you know it's it's a, it's uh, tethered to some reality that we think maybe is being, you know, overlooked. Uh, but yeah. maybe that reality could also be tethered to some other agenda. You know, so it's, you know, yeah. I think it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah. And, and you could look at, you know, as an example, you could look at Game of Thrones, you know, which is kind of a standard example that I pull up a lot for things like this, that, you know, there isn't a single really redeeming character in the whole thing. And apparently George R.R. R. Martin was trying to do a fantasy in which people acted realistically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which tells you a lot about his view of human nature. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, so we have a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, so the medium, you mentioned that earlier. Um, are you familiar with Martin as massage? <laughs> sure, 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 yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's a place to kind of brain truth and fairy tale to the new mediums that exist today. Okay. And is there any wisdom? You're engaging in a new medium. You're doing podcasting. Right. And so, even from your own personal experience, like, how do we bring these truths to new mediums? Okay, so the question has to do with Marshall McLuhan and the medium is the message idea, uh, but also the fact that we have new media and that you know, we are kind of learning about this, these media as we uh, use them. So like a podcast was, you know, we, we actually are involved with producing a podcast. Um, so how do we think about new media? How do we think about the fact that media has its own kind of sort of tacit content? Uh, and I think that's what McLuhan was getting at. Um, with regard to the Christian faith, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, Tom, you want to go? <laughs> no, you like yeah, you're about yeah. to say something. You're the technology guy, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think a lot about this. I mean, it, as you know, as a um, a creaturely created form, um, you know, a lot of technology. Um, it is an aspect of creation. So it has, as a creature, I mean, just because I make a form of technology that can help me 
gain some kind of um, enhancement to to carry out the work that I do in creation. It has to conform to creation in a particular way, but it is uh, a part of creation. I just have a hand in it. Um, so, so with that said, there's a fallen dimension because I'm fallen, but there is also something that is is a byproduct of being a creature, and it's a creature. So it can be, like any creaturely thing, a medium um, for different th things, um, human communication back and forth and, and other things. Um, and so, but there are, or there is, um, um, gains and losses. Um, and, and so these are things we're always having to calculate, um, not just in a utilitarian way, but really in a spiritual, intellectual, and all moral way. Um, you know, what is being impacted and affected? What is being distorted? What is being enhanced? I mean, these are just some of the questions we, we, we can ask. Um, for example, we all know just having, you know, just having, you know, the, these things, all the different ramifications, um, our continuous dependency on them, the way in which we, we, we start to turn to them for quick information rather than, you know, utilizing things that we, we you know, our own brain and memory for that matter. Um, our inner relations are, are continuously, you know, right. um, detached in embodied ways and connected in, in these, these other forms. So I don't know that we even know the losses or gains in any kind of full sense, but we do have to think about them. Um, and, and I do think, for example, especially with societies now impacted, for example, by the, the, the Internet and social media and the, the global impact of that in the way in which this is also something you're seeing big tech um, continuously forming people and limiting people and limiting interpretations and all the like. Um, so you're seeing how sinister it can all get. And, and you can really use, you know, a little scientific uh, uh, or science fiction and start imagining where this could go. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I, we did a show on technology. I'll wrap up real quick with this, where we talked about there, it kind of being really the way we order our loves as we begin to, to understand this, it can become very dark as Heidegger, the, the postmodern philosopher thought, um, or, or there can be gains and losses and we're going to have to adjust to them as Christians in each case. Yeah, I think about particularly uh, podcasts. So obviously uh, podcasts are great from our perspective because you know we've been able to, through our podcast, connect with people all over the world. But uh, at the same time, we're not the only podcast. <laughs> I mean, they, pro <laughs> they proliferate. I mean, there's just like, uh, there's more every day. Uh, I remember when I was a kid in the 60s and 70s, there were three networks, or three and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and everything, you know, you go to school and everybody had watched the same television show the night before. You know, it was just a whole different yeah. reality. <laughs> and uh, so there was a, there was a kind of a, kind of a, a shared body of entertainment information that we had. Uh, at the same time, uh, there were certain things that people just didn't talk about. Uh, and th there were certain things that never came up. So uh, getting back to this whole matter of, you know, gains and losses, I think of the, you know, the parable of the wheat and the tares. I think perhaps that's relevant here. Uh, there are certain things that are great about what's going on, and there are certain things that are not so great. Uh, you know, just think about the fact that, you know, in our local churches, um, you know, one of the things that's great about a local church, of course, is that you have all of these people present with you physically, and, and they, they kind, of, kind of the fact that they're, they're not like you is a good thing in the sense that it forces mm -hmm. you to interact with people who don't share all of your interests, all of your obsessions, that kind of stuff. At the same time, um, if, if you didn't have any connection with people who actually did share your interests, <laughs> and you found yourself in this situation where, like, nobody understands me here, <laughs> you know, and that's all you had, uh, that would be yeah. kind of sad. So uh, I think the trick is how do we... How do we extract what's beneficial from the, from the good developments that we see with new technologies and mitigate or sort of downplay or, or control the negative effects? 
And I think in this case, one of those negative effects is we, we can find ourselves in touch with people all over the world and completely alienated from everybody around us. Yeah, I would like to add one thing as a historian here. Um, I'm gonna refer you to a couple of books, actually one book and then it's condensed version. Uh, Elizabeth Eisenstein wrote a book called The Printing Press as an Agent of Social Change. The condensed version of it is The Printing Revolution in Early Modern Europe. Now, the reason why I want to bring those things up is um, the internet and things like podcasts and everything else, the only real analog we have of those things is printing. And if you read Betty's work here, it gives you an eye, it, it really is an eye opener showing you just how significant printing was and how much it, it changed the world. What we're going through right now is a communications revolution every bit as big as printing. And I think being aware of the kinds of things that printing did might illuminate some of the ways or might help us think through some of the ways that the kind of communications technology we have with the internet, what it might do and how it might affect the way we think and well, social change and all of those kinds of things. So I would refer you back to those books. And I, I think it was uh, Glenn, one, I think a, a long time ago, you told me about a book um, called, uh, I, I think it was Printing Propaganda in Martin Luther um, by Mark Edwards. And, and it, 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 you know, and it talks about the way in which a lot of the Reformation was carried out and often won <laughs> by who, who won in that printing propaganda war. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and yeah, so, Luther, so it's interesting, gains and losses. <laughs> Luther said God invented the printing press to reform his church. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and some of those uh, publications are kind of at the level of the meme. And, you know, if you go back and yeah. you look at some yeah. of those tracks, yeah. <laughs> you get some pretty yeah. graphic and sort of uh, <laughs> scatological yeah. material. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my my favorite my favorite in that category is uh, a thing that they put out. It was a broadside that that was attacking Cardinal Bellarmine in the church, and what they did, not, no not Bellarmine Cardinal Cayetan um, Bellarmine was later that was Galileo, um, but what they did is they had these these verses written under it, and the picture was of a guy in you know, a cardinal hat and all that. So it was obvious we were dealing with a cardinal, and then the verses told you who it was. Except in fe instead of a face, he had a buttocks. <laughs> and out of, the, out of the buttocks, for a nose, was a harp. And the reason why that's important is if you take a harp outside and the wind blows on it, the strings will vibrate and you'll get sound. So the implication is that whenever Kayaten spoke, well, yeah, I think you can work out the rest of it. <laughs> that could get you canceled today, but back then it helped to win the recognition. Anyway, Absolutely. Facebook <laughs> jail. And you think Doug Wilson is edgy. <laughs> so I, I saw Larson, you had a question. Uh, yeah, just in the, on the general theme of bottlerism and, um, and how far... There, there was a, a, a recent pro podcast with Indy Wilson, uh, Story of Their Soul Food, that my son was telling me about. And he was just making the point that the level of violence in, uh, even in something as gaudy or as bad as Game of Thrones, doesn't come close to biblical proportions. You know, <laughs> like, like, like you think of David and the hundred foreskins. It's like like right. nobody <laughs> nobody in Hollywood would portray that. Right? It's, like, like, it's, it's in our holy text. So, right. just, the, just the topic of violence in general, it seems like scripture has a much higher tolerance for violence. And your comment earlier just about fairy tales or stories that are mom safe. Um, my son works for Lore TV, and they, 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 they've said several times that our standard for movies can't be what's not in them, you know? Um, and so anyway, just, just kind of riffing on that bottlerism theme and I guess violence in particular. 
So the question has to do with uh, how we've kind of uh, sanitized things to the point where we're not even aware of how far we've gone from biblical standards yeah, in the sense that there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that is not family friendly, according to uh, you know our understandings of family friendly entertainment. <laughs> and uh, you know what do we do about that? And as a pastor, for example, you know uh, you know you come to those passages, and, you, and particularly if you've got a lot of little people in the room, you know, because we're we're all about you know everybody's in the room. <laughs> you know, what do you do with that? I, I think about that a lot, you know, and uh, I think Andy Wilson, you know, in his point and stories are soul food about, you know, the biblical standard and our standard um, are not the same. Uh, there seems to be a higher level of tolerance for violence in the Bible. So what, what, what do you think about that, guys? <laughs> what, do you, what do you make of that? Genre. I mean, when you're dealing with nonfiction, the Bible, or when you're dealing with history, it's one thing when you're doing a lot of violence. When you are using violence to make a point, a specific point in a plot line, and there are places where violence can be appropriate in a plot line, that's a different thing. When you're using violence surely for its own entertainment value, that's a different matter. The, the violence in the Bible is not intended to be entertainment. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, you know, when you're dealing with reality, we've got to face the fact that we live in a violent world and discussions of violence and depictions of violence in connect. You can't do a film about the Holocaust without dealing with violence. Right. That's reality. But for yeah. pure entertainment value, eh, that's a different thing. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I remember that when I was, uh, when my, thir he's 13 now, but when he was little, my son Finn, um, we were driving, we had the kind of Old Testament, uh, the, you, know, on, you know, on the DVD rolling in the car. And he was just at that age where he knew what good behavior and, and kind of rough behavior was. And they kept talking about God's judgment and the, you know, the stubbornness of Israel and 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 Finn looked up. He goes, "God's being very rude," <laughs> because he didn't. He he was associating it with like right, you know right. you know you know the the bully at school, not someone. So it was a good point time for me to actually not sanitize it, but talk to him about the difference between the holiness of God and 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 God being God and the way to understand this. So it became a a point of teaching rather than having him you know, shy away from it. And I remember once uh, going to, a, a, I was vi when I was in Oxford, I came to visit my family in Virginia and a friend invited me to the local Episcopal church. And I remember them uh, during the, the kind of, uh, I think it was during the Easter season. So it was one of the liturgies. And I remember them reading the, the Psalms and, and when they came up to God's wrath, they literally skipped right over those passages and went to the next ones. I mean, this is a, that, that the Bible itself... <laughs> Um, yeah, we're uh, bold, vulgarizing the Bible, right? That's right. That's right. So they 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 had their kind of you know canon within the canon, so to speak. Only those things that were consistent with this kind of sentimental view of love versus the full full ramifications of God and and the the perfection God is. Well, you know, in the nineteenth century, we saw kind of the feminization of Christianity. And uh, it was more or less, of, you know, in, you know, the, the catechi catechizing children was left to mom. And we ended up with this sort of uh, saccharine Christianity that a lot of young men uh, rejected. Um, and, you know, I wonder if uh, it's not so much we, we should expect our wives to kind of deal with this kind of stuff, so much as it is we really need to be the guys who are kind of the go-to guys when it comes to this stuff. So like in our, in our family, you know, there was just certain subjects that I knew that my wife would never get to. <laughs> and so, you know, I would talk to the kids and say, okay, when, we, when it comes to these matters, you know, you and I will talk. And, you know, this is just between us. Uh, mom, it's not like we're trying to hide anything from mom, but just mom is not equipped to help you through this kind of stuff. And so those became kind of things that we would talk about, not like all the time or anything like that, but I, my my. The, the message I was kind of trying to send to the boys, particularly, uh, 
was that, you know, these realities are not something we need to just simply deny. We can talk about them, but sometimes uh, not in the presence of your mom, <laughs> if, you get, if you get my point. <laughs> like those urges boys have to beat up their neighbors sometimes <laughs> for, <laughs> that, yeah, that's, that's for one offending of them, them on the playground, you know? <laughs> that's right, that's right. So any other questions? Uh, yeah. yeah. This is probably a question for Glenda. Can you say any more about the history of fairy tales? Like, how far back do they go? And okay. Is there, like, um, you know, different people groups that have same versions, of, different versions of the same story, that kind of thing? Yeah, so the question has to do with the history of fairy tales. Glenn, is this is a question directed at you. Uh, can you get into maybe the, the, you know, the history of them? How far back do they go? Uh, what do we do with, uh, you know, questions related to are there different groups of people who have similar s stories? How do we understand that? Any, anything you want to say? Yeah, um, we can actually date a number of fairy tales. We know who wrote them originally. Um, you know, Hans Christian Andersen, or um, there, there are any number of people, uh, Charles Perrault, uh, uh, that we know authored some of the fairy tales. But when you're dealing with things like uh, the stories in, in the uh, Grimm collection, they go back a long way. I had a student who actually did a, um, a master's thesis where he was tracing the idea of the wild hunt, which shows up in, in a number of, of fairy tales, uh, but also in a number of cultures. And I... You can make an argument that that probably goes back to the days of the Proto-Indo-Europeans because you find it in all kinds of cultures, um, you know, the Celtic, the Germanic, you've got it in, you've got variations on it in places in the Middle East and so on. Um, it probably has roots that goes, go that far back. There is a Chinese story that's very similar to Cinderella. You know, so what we're, we're dealing with here in some cases may be just very, very old stories that have been brought forward in time. Or we are dealing with ideas, um, situations that crossed cultures and generated parallel stories. So it's actually a, you know, it's a very interesting question and, and there's no simple answer to it. Um, anybody who gives you a single answer is either doesn't know what they're talking about or they're oversimplifying because it's it's very complex and there's no real there, there are multiple channels by which these stories come to us. Hmm. Yeah, I uh I've got a resource that um I've used uh by a woman named Carol Rose. Uh it's a book that is an encyclopedia. Uh and I'm looking it up right now. Uh it's, it's out of print, but you can get it used. Okay, uh, let's just see. It yeah, it's called Spirits, Fairies, Leprechauns, and Goblins, an encyclopedia. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, a resource that uh, I think is great. It's she uh, goes uh, you know, around the world uh, and records you know, the instant instances in which different stories appear in different cultures. And she's also interested in kind of the convergence that Glenn talked about. So everything from Africa and Asia and just different things, the similarities between the folk tales and the, and the fairy tales and stuff. Um, any other questions? Yeah. yeah so regarding the concept of fairy tales and whatnot, I've heard, I've heard some moderns talk about how um, they're almost um, downplaying the Bible because they see some of the stories, especially in you know, the early chapters of Genesis as fairy tale like and say, hey, look, these other cultures have similar stories, maybe the creation account or the Noahic account. Um, and therefore they say, therefore Christianity can't be true, the Bible can't be real because look, there's similar stories over here. I think it, it might have even been C.S. Lewis that said, well, maybe that actually points to a greater reality that, that they all, you know, a truth that they all kind of flowed from. I'd be curious to hear your guys' thoughts on on that type of thing, where some moderns actually think some of the Bible stories are fairy tales, whereas opposed to the actual truth themselves. Right. So the question has to do with um, similarities to biblical stories, particularly in Genesis, uh, that we see in different cultures around the world, uh, which we now classify as fairy tales, and consequently now people uh, use that label to classify those stories in the Bible. <laughs> 
as fairy tales. What do we do with that? Uh, the questioner also noted that C.S. Lewis addressed this matter and had a particular approach. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that most people these days aren't using the category of fairy tales. They're using the category of mythology. Um, but it, it's still fundamentally the same question. What do you do with that? And I think uh, if I remember Lewis's answer right, I think I kind of agree with it that what we're seeing in this is not necessarily evidence that, oh, you know, th this is just the Hebrew version of, of Gilgamesh, you know, for the flood or something like that. But that all of them, I mean, virtually every culture around the world has has stories of a great flood. So now, does so, that mean so maybe there so, was a flood? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. That, that's kind of where that goes. Um, you know, so I don't think I, you know, I don't think that parallel stories necessarily. Well, I, I don't think they cast doubt on scripture at all. As a matter of fact, they may strengthen the argument for scripture. Um, but the other part of it is that Lewis talked about the idea of, I think he called it the good dreams, uh, something like that within paganism, where there were elements of the gospel that would be fulfilled in Christ that were anticipated in pagan religions. It doesn't mean that the gospel borrowed from them. As a matter of fact, it couldn't have because there was no contact culturally with many of these. But nonetheless, there was a sense in which, by general revelation or common grace or something like that, um, they had a hint of what was to come. Any thoughts, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I could spend a long time on that, I guess. But, uh, you know, just kind of a, a, few, a few points. I mean, one, we would expect there to be with the Genesis account a continuity with with things that were echoes of creation everywhere else. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been able to be communicated. Um, and I'm not worried that there were borrowings of terms or ideas or language because that's what God does. He takes the creaturely, sanctifies it to communicate um, the divine truth. I mean, they're all creaturely words. Uh, Hebrew didn't just jump out of the sky, although some people think it did, or, or <laughs> you know, the languages that are being drawn upon, right? There's histories there. And so what we, what we have with, with Genesis is, is something that whatever the continuities and similarities, um, the, it's the discontinuities and distinctions that, that are attractive. And then it's also the, the way in which this is part of a revelatory economy, which brings people into its truth and converts them to see it. So, so that's that's something that the historian can't really get a hold of. You don't you don't typically see you know the Gilgamesh uh, epic you know bringing people into conversion and then then um, you know and and the way the way that this this text does um, you know those are a couple things um, and the theology of it is very very different um, even if there are similarities in terms to, to things going on um, and th I think I think we also and I don't think the church has ever had a full grip on what's exactly going on in that text and that's part of the beauty of it it's pressing us by a lot of the mystery bound up with it to keep returning to it um, you'll read Augustine's commentary on Genesis. It's going to be very different than, you know, the stuff written today versus the stuff written, you know, with Luther. Um, even though they're all reading the same text and relating to it as revelation. So even within the church, um, how they deal with it. I mean, I know some people kind of, you know, oh, we've got the key now and you have to trust us. Um, that I have more suspicions to those, those types of figures. Um, so I, I think we, we have something beautiful with the text of Genesis. We have the initiation of the Christian vision of things that distinguishes it from the start from everything else, but it informs the rest of Revelation, and it, it helps ground the continuity um, all the way through, through the book of Revelation. So um, those are just some thoughts, but uh, there, there could be a, a lot of, we could spend a lot of time on that theme, really a show or two on it. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like the, you can't win with these people. So if there were no similarities, they say that was proof that uh, the Christian revelation isn't true. And now that there are evident similarities, it's proof that the Christian revelation isn't true. You just can't win with these people. Yeah.
You know, so yeah. anyway, maybe that means we shouldn't like spend too much time worrying about what those people think. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we probably should wrap this up. It's about 930 here, and I know it's about 1030 uh, where you are, Tom. And uh, you probably yeah, have to get yeah. up in the morning. <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have a meeting at five thirty uh, Central Time. So <laughs> that's right. Well, that was a very, very uh, nice uh, thought or sort of cons- you know, sort of way of scheduling things uh, for you there, Glenn. <laughs> anyway, uh, we really appreciate all the folks who came out tonight. Thank you for attending the the, the show and. And uh, uh, it's great to do things like this, to actually connect with people who listen to the show on a regular basis. You're not actually, you're not just like emails. You are physical beings who are out there who uh, actually listen to us. And, and we're very grateful for that. So thanks, thanks for coming out tonight. And thanks for your questions. Anyway, we should probably wrap it up. <laughs>